We're in a message, a, a, a series of messages, a theme simply called Come Up Higher. Come Up Higher. And today we're going to shift from the book of Revelation to Psalm 24, but it's, gonna, it's the same idea. And um, just follow along. Today's message is called Ascending the Hill of the Lord. Ascending the Hill of the Lord. And the text begins in Revelation 4. Follow along as I read. It says, after these things, this is verse 1 of Revelation 4. After these things, I looked and behold a door standing open to heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here, come up here, come up higher. I'll show you things which must take place after this. Immediately, I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and someone sat on the throne. Now, Psalm 24, we're going to be here for a bit, Psalm 24, and I'll just tell you that when the ancients read this psalm, especially when they read it in a public assembly, they read it... Um, uh, sing song. They read it as a, as a re responsive song. So the, whoever was leading the assembly would re read the first part, and then the whole congregation would respond with the second verse. Would you like to try? Yes. You up for it? Yes. Okay. All in favor say, I'm getting ready for the business meeting. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Ready? The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? You guys aren't together at all. You know that, right? <laughs> it's just like heaven. You're like reverberating. Holy, 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 holy. It's all over the... It's okay, I love it. He shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of Moses. Yeah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift up you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. This, dear friends, is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. Last Sunday after this service, I went to a wedding up um, really close to, close to Oklahoma, and I especially loved this wedding because the vows were so unusual. They were so sincere and filled with expectation, and Pastor Tim was conducting the ceremony, and he told them that after they had exchanged their vows, they could kiss one another, and then he pronounced them. He said over them, you are now husband and wife. He said, the two have become one. But were they really one? Because it's been my experience that two becoming one takes a little more time. It's been my experience that two becoming one takes a little more than a pronouncement. It actually requires a process. Two, two becoming one at my house has to do with deciding who's going to put the dishes away whenever we've um, been in the kitchen a while. Two becoming one at my house requires us to have some talks from time to time about money and how we're spending it and how we're going to adjust. How we're Two becoming one involves deciding who's going to apologize first. Come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about here. All the married people are saying, hmm. I mean, it might take a trip to Italy. Who knows? I'm just telling you that it, there's a process involved. And, and I'm using that as an illustration to help us understand that that's kind of how our relationship with God is. 
In the same way that we launch a relationship with our spouse at a wedding, we launch our relationship with God by getting saved. And when we get saved, come on somebody, something actually happens. It's not unimportant. It's, it's a legal transaction. It's, it's a spiritual phenomenon. It's a birth of the Holy Spirit. But if I can explain this, and I think you have to focus for me to, for, to, to get this, the glory of our salvation is not the legal part. It's not the certificate that you get at baptism. The glory of salvation is a process. You have to grow the potential of your salvation. You have to grow the process of building the kingdom. So come up higher is the language that we're using, which really is the idea that God wants to, he wants to interact with his people in extraordinary ways. He does not want us just to be normal. He wants us to be... uh, authoritative in the earth, miracle workers in the earth, but, but the process matters. Um, I know Christians, and they get so frustrated and they get so disappointed because they thought the first encounter that they were going to have with the Lord would not only wipe all their sin away, it was going to get rid of all their bad habits, and that didn't happen. I know, I know some Christians who thought that when they came forward and received the Lord that they would not only get rid of their sin, they would get rid of their depression and they would fix all the problems that have been piling up for years in their life. But problems that have taken a lifetime to accumulate tend to hang on a little bit after you've been saved. Can I tell you the truth about this? Your sin is immediately gone. But your habits might hang on for a while. Your, your, your sin is washed away as far as the east is from the west. But the environment that was supporting sin and brokenness, that, that, that environment around you stays the same. See? So when God decided in the book of Revelation, I want to show my people a picture. I want to show them a throne. I want to show them that there's someone on the throne and that there are el- He's showing God's, he's showing the family. He's showing the elders. He's showing the church worshiping around the throne. He's actually imagining us. He, he is offering to us an opportunity to imagine our salvation at levels I don't think most of us have ever imagined. Um, let me, start, let me work at this a little bit. When you read the Bible, the reason you read the Bible is to get pictures about God. Okay? I read the part, God brings manna and he brings water to his children when they're in the wilderness. That's a great picture of God. You keep reading and you come to the part where God can turn water into wine. You go, I like that, that's good. (laughs) There's a God of joy here. And you keep reading and you come to God hanging on a cross, paying, paying for our sins. And you keep reading and you get to the fact that, oh, he rose from the dead. And, And I'm just saying, The image is, that's why we read the Bible, because God keeps presenting himself to us. But that's not the only reason we read the Bible. The other reason we read the Bible is because the Bible is not just about the images of God, it's about the images of us. Yeah. You read the Bible and you go, oh, it it, it all begins with us in the Garden of Eden hanging out and there's an image of us. And then, oh, there's an image of us as the children of God. We've been adopted. And oh, there's an image of us as the priest of God. And oh, there's an image of us as the kings. And oh, there's a a progression. And I I love how the progression of God increases. Like, oh my goodness, eyes like fire and hair like wool. That's what we read in the book of Revelation. And, And a sword coming out of his mouth. But I like the progression of the images of God's people as well. I I like the fact that we get better. Jesus himself, right? Like him at the throne with the glory. That's a little bit different image than him as the rabbi washing the feet of his disciples. So he's showing us different images of himself because he knows that to the degree that we can capture those images, uh, we become like what we see. We become like what we worship. Yeah. So 
So we want everybody to get saved. That's a big deal. Oh, come on. That is so important. Get saved. You're not saved? Let's get saved. But then after we get saved, the Bible is so clear that we have an opportunity to grow in the knowledge of God and to grow in the knowledge of who we are as we see these progressive images of God. Are you with me? Come on, nod at least. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've just tried to imagine what a difference it would make in my own life if I lived with a psychological reality that there's a king on the throne, I see the image, and, and not only is there a king on the throne, that king on the throne is connected to me in a practical way. The king on the throne lives near me and, and in me, and I'm seated with him. That's the image. I'm seated with him in the heavenly realms, and, 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 and the two are becoming one. Oh, my goodness. The two are uniting. I mean, what a difference it would make if I actually believe that a few little fish and loaves in the hands of God would be enough for me to face any problem that I, it would be, there'd be leftovers, and the one who caused that to happen is connected to me would make a difference in my daily life. It would make a difference in my daily life if I just actually believed, oh, he's not dead. He's just asleep. It would make a difference in my daily life if I literally believe prostitutes make better worshipers than, than religious people, you know? That's the way I approach life. If, if, if the storms of life, I, they didn't cause me to be afraid because I knew that there was an image of a God who could speak the storms and they would, they would go calm and the one who has that kind of a life is one with me. One? We're becoming one? I'm talking about life that's birthed in the spirit. I'm talking about life that is eternal. I'm talking about divine life. I'm talking about heaven's life. That, If the gospel is true, and it is, this life is uniting with our mind and our body. Oh, my goodness. And, and I don't know, I just feel that we've shortchanged our salvation if we just limit it to the forgiveness of sins. I feel like if we just limit it to the forgiveness of sins, our, our baptism, our well-meaning vows, that we're not committed to the process with God. And the process with God is what makes progress in how we operate in the earth. Somebody say amen, because I have decided I'm going to explore the process because God has announced progress over my life. When I say my life, I'm not just talking about the years that I have here on the earth. I'm talking about my life. Life in union with the one who sits on the throne. There's a lot to discover here. See. So this, this hill of the Lord, who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? It's a metaphor. And the idea is you, you, can go, you can go higher. You can get closer to God. And as you get closer to God, you're going to become more like him. You're going to progress. There's a process. Go up, you're going, to get, you're going to become more like. It's a process we understand, those of us who, who are married. I mean, we understand, we understand. I like Italian food now. It took a process. You know what I'm saying? I, I like watching WNBA basketball because the one I love loves WNBA basketball. So as I love her, the process causes me to have new values and new understanding. Therefore, my life is richer because of WNBA basketball. What a testimony that is, right? But I'm just trying to get you to understand that ascending, ascending is about people who intentionally say, I'm going to get closer to God. And, and I expect that as I get closer to God and stay closer to God, I'm going to change. I'm going to get better. I'm not just saved. I'm being conformed to the image of the Son of God. So ascend the hill of the Lord. By the way, hills are a pretty big deal in the Bible. I don't know if you noticed that, but a lot of good things happen on hills. By the way, I'm going to take my time with this message. I'm not going to finish it today, so don't be disappointed. I promise we'll get to it. We'll get to it over the years, should the Lord tarry. But um, 
Hills are a big deal. Moses met God on the hill, and the Lord said, here's how I want my people to worship, and here are the Ten Commandments. And Elijah conquered a drought because he said a prayer on a hill, and, and Jesus was transfigured on a hill, and he shed his blood on a hill. And when he returns to the earth, he's, the Bible so specifically says he's going to be on a hill. It's going to come be on a hill. I'm just saying God things happen on hills. That's why we have legitimate expectation that there's going to be a great revival in Cedar Hill, Texas. Because you shouldn't name a city after a valley because there's only the shadow of death in the valley. But, but in the hills, there's going to be some things that we, that we legitimately claim for. My favorite verse about hills is in the Song of Solomon. And it says, the voice of my beloved, behold, he comes leaping upon the mountains and skipping upon the hills. So hills, hills are places of encounter and revelation and dominion and, and, and the throne is in the, is in the hills. And when we ascend the hill, it's representing that we have deliberately engaged a process that we expect has progress to it. Psalm 24 involves a very specific hill. Again, when the ancients read this, they knew what hill they were talking about. They were like, oh, we're talking about Mount Zion. We're talking about the hill of the Lord. Because that was the location of the temple. That was the place where the Ark of the Covenant was. And so when God's people talked about a hill, a hill, the hill of the Lord, they knew Mount Zion at the top is the temple. And if I could just, this is the mindset, if I could just get to the hill, if I could just get to the top of the hill, God will hear me. If I can just get to the top of the hill, things are going to be okay. If I can just get to the top of the hill, my enemies will be defeated and, and, and bad things will turn good. And, and, and I'll be blessed when I get to the top of the hill. But then I started reading the Psalms. And I found a group of Psalms. If we had time today, we'd just read them. But from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, there's a whole songbook filled with psalms, and they are called, who knows what they're called, the Psalms of Ascent, the Psalms by which we climb the hill, the Psalms by which we go up higher. And what would happen is the people of God who had scattered across the land would get these psalms, and they would start singing these psalms on the way to the feast at the top of the hill, whether it was the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of... They would sing these songs together, and when I read these psalms, I began to realize that they didn't actually have to get to the top of the hill before good things began to happen. I began to notice as I read the psalms that fear began to dissipate as they were on their way. I began to notice that energy would increase, that generosity generations would begin to learn the name of the Lord, that love would begin to grow, not when they finally got to the hill, but in the process by which they were. Is this making sense to you? Somebody needs to say, I, I, if Daniel, come on, sing it right where you're at. I thank God for the journey. Thank you for the journey. I used to say, thank you for some parts of the journey. But I'll be honest, I, I'm old enough now that I literally can say, no, God, thank you for every part of the journey. Because what I'm learning is that every part of the journey offers a new face of God. And when I find the face of God in this part of the journey, it creates new capacity for me. So I'm seeing a progress of who God is, and I'm seeing a progress of who I am as I see. I wish we were better at valuing the process. I, I love a God who took seven days to create the heavens and the earth. Why? How many of you believe he could have probably done it in one? Yeah, but he has, he's a God of process. 
And every day he would create something and he would step back and he would say, oh, it's good. It's good. Come on, son. Come on, spirit. Let's celebrate. It's good. There's a progress. There's a process. And, and, and when he finished the process, he's, oh, it's, it's very good. It's, it, it's all done. But I, I'm just wanting to celebrate. I, 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 this is kind of a cliche. I've heard preachers use this a lot. But come on, church. I know we're not where we will be, but I'm celebrating that we're not where we're used to be the process my salvation is finished it is complete I have a covenant that is unshakable with the Lord I have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb but I know I can grow stronger I, I know I can love better I know I can treat my enemies better think more heavenly I know I can overcome things that used to n knock me down. And I'm just saying, if we don't get this right, if we don't get this right, if, if all we celebrate is baptism, if all we celebrate is somebody filling out a salvation card or saying the prayer or somebody decreeing, now, now you're saved, then I'm, I'm telling you the truth. Your old influences will keep too much power in your life. If, if all we're celebrating is the forgiveness of sin, you'll be saved and still get the divorce. You'll be saved and still be afraid. You'll be saved and still be lonely Come on, there's a difference between having your sins forgiven and being a door through which the glory of God comes in. There's a difference between getting right with God and reigning in the earth. There's a difference between being justified and being glorified. There's a difference between crossing the Red Sea and confronting the giants that are in the land so that you can build the, 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 the kingdom of God in the land that he's promised. I mean, I... Mostly, mostly the early service, not this service, but I know some people that get saved and nothing changes. Nothing changes. I mean, I guess their sins are forgiven because God is faithful and just to forgive our sins. He loves to do that. But they, their sins are forgiven and they're still mean. Their sins are forgiven. Don't, don't point. That's so rude when you start pointing at people like that. I mean, they're saved, but they're still... They're still stingy. They're saved, but they're still telling dirty jokes 40 years after they came to the altar to get saved. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't celebrate forgiveness of sins. Absolutely. That's the beginning of our journey with God. But there is a vision over our salvation. God has something in mind besides just wiping our slate clean. Come on, somebody. He has decreed over us that we're to be sons and kings and priests and of the same spirit that raised Jesus from the... Come on, we're supposed to have authority in the earth to heal the sick and to cast out the demons and to love our enemies. Come up higher, church. Come up higher. Now, the, now this psalm, again, I'm just, I'm planning on, I really didn't even get through two, two of the points in the first service, so I'll stop after the first point, probably, but, but um, the psalm breaks into four very easy divisions, and, and I'd like to walk you through it. Um, the first division of the psalm, I'll just call Revelation. I know we've been in the book of Revelation, but there's Revelation in Psalm 24 as well. Here's the revelation. It says, it says, the earth is the Lord's. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and all those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Now this is a revelation of who God is. This is God giving himself, giving a picture of who he is to his people. And this is where... This is where the process begins, when God says, you need to know who I am. Um, it was actually, not this past Christmas, but Christmas a year ago, someone had leased our facility for a big worship event, and um, it was, it went a Friday night and a Saturday, and it was, I was excited, but my tradition is to come in on Saturdays and spend some time with the Lord when hopefully there are not too many people around, and I always bring cash, my dog, I always bring him with me. And, you know, first time people meet cash, they're a little bit like, why is a dog in the, in, in the church? But he likes to come. He likes to pray. You know, he just does. He, 
So, so I bring him, and, and our, it was our Saturday morning ritual, and I, we were out, out, out there in the, in the foyer and, and just walking through, and I was just looking kind of at the displays that this group had, had, had put up to use our facility, and, and all of a sudden, their security people came from both sides, had their little microphones in their ears, and they, they came up to me, you know, and, and they're like, they're like, Doors are not open yet. And what are you doing with a dog here? And, and who are you? And I'm, I'm kind of like, uh, this is my place. And I bring my dog to my place, and I'm pretty sure that they're like, the dog has to go. And I'm like, eh, the dog's probably going to stay. I'm not sure if you get to or not, but <laughs> like, I, I, I've got a key here. I'm established. Come on. You see, they thought I was just a normal person. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm not a normal person. No, 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 tell the devil, I'm not a normal person. And, and you see, this is, this is what the Lord, how he begins the process. He says, I think you probably need to know who I am. I am the Lord who created the earth in all its fullness. I am the Lord who established this world and those who dwell in it. I am the Lord who founded this thing upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And so life beyond normal begins, listen to this, life beyond normal begins when you see who God is, and, and, and see, this is how God, how kind he is. God's like, no, oh, I want you to know who I am, how I relate to the earth. I'll show you this is your invitation. And church, this is where worship begins. Worship begins when you start saying and believing who God says he is. You, you can't just say it. Anybody can say anything. Anybody can sing the lyrics to the songs. But the process begins when you start living as though what you say is true. Yeah. This, is, this is an important point. Worship and spiritual formation go together. Worship and spiritual formation go together. But you're not going to worship until you have a revelation of who God is. And when you start worshiping who God is, the effect on you is what begins the process. Let me just give you an interesting side note, and then, and then we'll, be, we'll be close to being done. Here's the interesting side note. When the ancients read Psalm 24, they read it as a package with Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. Like they would never read 24 by itself. They would go 22, 23, 24. And many of you would know that these are very important psalms. Psalm 22 presents a very particular image of who God is. This is a revelation of God. It's the prophecy of Jesus dying on the cross. Psalm 22 is the most accurate portrait. It's like my bones are out of joint. My thirst is overwhelming. The people are around me, and they're mocking me, and they're, and they're dividing my garments with lots. I mean, that's right there in the psalm. The Psalm 22 is the image of a God who loves you so much that he would give his only begotten son to die on the cross that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but that's a really awesome image. But then, start reading Psalm 23. You already know Psalm 23. Some of you, the Lord is my... A new image, a progressive image. Now it's different. Now we've got Jesus, we've got God off the cross. We, we've got someone who, who's not suffering anymore. He has a loving rod and a staff with which he is unhooking us from our chaos. He is delivering us from evil. He is chasing me with his goodness and his mercy all the days of my life. He is preparing a table for me in the midst of my enemies. Now I've got a better reason to worship. Not only did he die on a cross. He has come to be my shepherd, and he is with me in all of the episodes of my life. Psalm 23. But the idea is, come on, come on, people of God, keep reading. 
Go to Psalm 24. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? The Lord's strong and mighty. Now we've got a warrior king. Now we've got a God who is mighty in battle. Now we have a God who wants to come from his heavenly throne into the earth and establish his dominion and his goodness among every episode and every situation. And I just want to remind you, we become like what we worship. And I just think it's time for the church to start moving from 22 to 23. It's it's. 2024, right? It's 2024. So if your only image of Jesus is a 22 image, come on over to 24 because the glory of the Lord is about to be released. But it takes a process. It takes a process. That's why the enemy wants to keep you down. That's why the enemy wants to keep you small. He wants you just to live a normal life. I, I, honestly, I, I don't know this for sure, but it seems to me that he really doesn't care that much if you connect with God in Psalm 22. He doesn't care if your sins are forgiven. <laughs> He's not battling to, to send you to hell. He's battling that the glory of the Lord won't show up in the earth. He... <laughs> He probably doesn't even care that much if you get into Psalm 23 because he doesn't care if you're depending on the Lord for your daily strength. But I believe hell trembles when there's a group of people who start saying, but I see another vision. I see another God. It's the same, but I see. I see a new dimension of who he is. I see me in a new place. I see me not as a sheep needing the care of a shepherd. I mean, I do. I always need the cross. I always need the shepherd, but I see myself as a door. I see myself as a gate. I see myself as someone who has the capacity to operate in two environments at the same time. I can operate in the earthly realm, and I can operate in the heavenly realm, and I have the capacity to open open up my life so that through me comes the glory of the king, the mighty warrior. He's going to show up through my life. The devil doesn't want any of that. The devil doesn't want any of that. 22, 23, 24. All of those are revelations of who God is. All of those are like, you just need to know who I am. And as we progressively know who he is, we progressively know who we are. I got six minutes. You want to do number two? How about part of number two? Just part of it. The less I preach today, the less study time I have to put in for next, for next time. So I can just carry this over. So the psalm begins with revelation. You need to know who I am. The psalm continues with invitation. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who is going to draw close to God? And so here's an invitation. We're looking for somebody who decides intentionally, I'm going to get closer to God. And, and, and I like that. I like the invitation because you need to know if you have an invitation. If you try to get close to Taylor Swift, if you try to get close to the president, you're going to get tackled or arrested. I mean, you, you, need, you need to know them well, and they need to know that you know them well. Yet, Jesus, can I just read you, listen carefully to Hebrews 4, 16. Let us draw near. Let, uh, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace in the time of need. Can I just remind you that you don't need grace and mercy when you get to the top of the hill. You need grace and mercy on your way to the hill. Whew. So, 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 so who is going to ascend? Who's going to take this climb? And the answer is anyone who finds the grace. But they see, that's the problem with the human heart. We don't, we resist the grace. Because we have this instinct, I don't need your grace. 
I can do things on my own. I'll solve my own problems. I'll live my own life. I'll ascend to the, I'll ascend, that's what Satan said, I'll ascend on my own. I don't, I don't want the grace. But grace is for drawing near. Grace is not passive. Grace is not passive. Grace, here's the definition of grace. Grace is God acting to accomplish in us what we cannot accomplish on our own. Grace is God acting to accomplish in us what we cannot accomplish. Uh, that's why I don't even like the testimony. So says, yeah, I received his grace. Okay, past tense, I received his grace. But what did you become after you received his grace? And what are you becoming as you rely on his grace in your journey? I mean, we have a God who is perpetually offering non-normal resources to human beings. Non-human resources, and this is what we're calling the grace. He has grace not only to save us, not only to rescue us, but grace by which we ascend into the higher places. Now, the psalmist deals with it. He says, who shall ascend? And he has five ideas. I'm not going to preach this. I just want to show you that I read the Bible. Five ideas. He says, here's, here's who ascends to the hill of the Lord. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And, and when, when you do that research on that, the real idea is that, yeah, my heart is being expressed through my hands. Like I believe something in my heart is showing up in my life. And, and by the way, the verb suggests continuous cleansing and continuous purity. So as you ascend, something is happening in your heart and it's being delivered through your hands. Number two, who shall ascend? People who are not deceived are deceitful. Number three, who shall ascend? People who are willing to receive God's blessings. So, come on, who's that? Number four, people who are a sin, people who are willing to receive their righteousness from God, who is our salvation. Whew. Come on, we re by faith, we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But that's not just a one time thing. This psalm suggests that we can increasingly receive right things in our life. We can increasingly receive right ideas. We can increasingly receive right decisions. We can increasingly receive right relationships. That doesn't have to happen at the top of the hill. That happens as we're singing the psalms of ascent on the way to the top of the hill. And, and the fifth one is that who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? The person who is free from idols. There's a freedom. There's a freedom in this journey. No longer do I lift my soul, lift my soul, lift my soul. To, no longer do I lift my soul to things that, that I think I need to live well. That's what an idol is. Something I think I need in order to live well. No longer do I lift my soul to things that I think I need to live well. I don't need, I don't have anymore the attachments of my soul to the ideologies or the values that are going to hinder my worship. As I begin to ascend, the attachments that have kept me in this environment begin to be released. And by the help of the grace and by the help of the Holy Spirit, I begin to have a freedom that allows me to see progress Progressive images of who God is, and therefore progressive images of who I can be as I keep my gaze upon Him, free from idols. Now, I used to read this list and get depressed because I thought this is where the qualifications to get me to the, to the hill. Like, oh my gosh, my hands will never be clean enough, and my heart will never be pure enough, and, and I'm so easily deceived. And, I'm so easily attached to ambition or fear or shame. I'm so easily attached. But now, church, I realize that this is not a qualification to ascend. This is the transformation that takes place as I ascend. These are the grace gifts that I discover when I set my heart to a process of progress. This is what comes that moves my life from normal life to a greater union with the, the life of the Spirit. This is what happens to work in me so that he can complete the good work that he began in me. I'm embarrassed how excited I am about this psalm. I wish you were half as excited as I am because this psalm gives me permission to 
to see a generation that is amazing by his grace. I see heaven's freedom all over his church. I see authority in the earth and righteousness like a river flowing through the chaos of our society. I see God's blessings coming down like showers in our hearts and our hands being united as we become doors. Doors. I, I think I'll stop there except for, except for two contexts that I need to give you as I, as I we're going to move toward a closing prayer. I want to give you two kind. Here's the rest of the outline, okay? In case you want to preach it to yourself. The first part of the psalm is the revelation. The second part of the psalm is the invitation. Are you guys with me? What's the first part of the psalm? What's the second part of the psalm? Here's the third part of the psalm, connection. There's a point where you actually connect with God. And this, this requires, verse 6, this is, this is Jacob, the generation of those who seek him. You have to have... You have to have a heart that wants to go far, farther with God. You have, to, you have to seek him. God will only give us so much revelation of who he is until you say, I want more. I want more. That's the point of connection. And then here's the last, here's the last point. There is an actual manifestation of his glory. There's a coming of the Lord. Not the coming of the Lord, but comings of the Lord. His, his glory, that's why he repeats it a couple of times, not just to emphasize it, but to let you know. Just because he came last year doesn't mean he's not going to come this year. <laughs> Lift up your heads, oh, you gays, and be lifted up, your everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord. The Psalm 22, Lord. The Psalm 23, Lord. Psalm 24, Lord, the Revelation 4, Lord, the Lord strong and mighty, mighty in battle, and he just repeats it. And there are two ideas. Here's the first. It's a cultural idea. When the king would return with his hosts, he would draw near to the castle, he would send a messenger to the door, and the messenger would say, let the king in. And the doorkeeper would say, who is the king? Give me the password. And if the king established his identity appropriately, the doorkeeper would open. And into the city would come the victory. Into the city. Can you imagine the atmosphere? Can you imagine the parties? Can you imagine the distribution of the resources and the spoils? The whole city. The whole city is dancing and praising and excited. And, and I don't know if this is stretching it, but I really want to say it. I feel like that's why we're doing Easter 100. Because doors want the victory of the king in their city. <sighs> No, no, I gotta. Doorkeepers have authority as to whether the glory comes in or not. And that's why he announces himself the King of Glory. And the doorkeepers say, Come on in. Come on in. And so when you're marching around your school or your neighborhood and you're praying or when you're doing that, this is a framework for you to say, I don't just want better technology for my schools. I don't just want my teachers to get a raise. I want all that. I want the glory of the Lord in my city. I want the glory of the Lord in my neighborhood. Here's the second co context of this psalm. You guys know that there was a time in the history of the people of God when they lost the glory of God. The glory of God was in the Ark of the Covenant, and, and they didn't regard the Ark of the Covenant. So it was taken by the enemies, and the enemies kept the Ark of the Covenant in their camp. But it didn't work out very well for the enemies. They, they got hemorrhoids. Read, read your Bible. It's very entertaining. 
if you have hemorrhoids, boom, we need to talk to you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So these, these, the Ark of the Covenant in the wrong place was just creating misery for the enemy. I don't like that. I don't like that. The Ark of the Covenant in the wrong place is actually the right place because it's creating misery for the enemy. Anyway, they, 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 uh, they sent the Ark away. And, and long story short, it ended up at a farmhouse a, a guy named Obed Edom, and he just put it out in the barn. But the Ark of the Covenant. But oh my goodness, his cow started getting stronger, and his his farm started having way more wheat than anybody else. The guy's getting blessed because the presence of God is there. Jesus, I need to preach this. Well, King David heard about a peasant with the presence. And he said, go get the Ark of the Covenant and bring it where it belongs, to Jerusalem. Bring it to the palace. Bring it up the hill. And so he sends, there's a lot of drama with it, but they finally get the Ark to Jerusalem outside the door. And the context of Psalm 24 is David writing a psalm where the Ark of the Covenant is right outside the door. And he's anticipating somebody open the door. Somebody open the gate so that the glory can return to the city of God. I use this context to prophesy over our church and over our city. The glory of the Lord is returning. Look, you can look at all the bad, a lot of data, statistics, suicide. I am telling you, the glory of the Lord is returning. It's returning. Come on, somebody help me say it. The glory of the Lord is returning. The glory of the Lord is returning. The glory of the Lord is coming home to the people of God. But, but we're the doors. We're the gates. And it doesn't come, doesn't come through the doors un until we say, yes, Lord. More than anything, we want your glory. I am the of exaltation. I was born to